Hello everyone and welcome to today's Ask the Author webinar, which is hosted by the York Environmental Sustainability Institute, which is based at the University of York. Um, YETI's aim is to facilitate and deliver world-class collaborative research in environmental sustainability, which is co-designed with the reach researcher community, industry and policymakers. The aim of the Ask the Author series is to showcase research being done at the University of York and provide people with the opportunity to ask researchers about their work. A reminder that today's event uh, is being recorded. And if you have any questions, you can type them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and then I'll, um, I'll ask your questions to Colin. If you have a follow up, I can unmute you and you can ask any, any further question directly. Um, today, I'd like to welcome Professor Colin Beale, who's based in the Department of Biology at the University of York. He's also YESI's uh, Resilient Ecosystem Theme co-lead. Um, he works on a wide range of ecological problems from population dynamics and, distribution to, and distributions to fire ecology in the African savannah. And much of his work focuses on birds. Today, he'll be talking about his recently published book, 101 Curious Tales of East African Birds. And now I'll pass over to Colin. Thank you, Jane. Um, so um, thank you very much, Jane. Hopefully everyone can see the slides. Um, and I'm going to be talking, uh, as Jane said, about the book that was published um, back in June, uh, 101 Curious Tales uh, of East African Birds, which has a subtitle, it's a brief interest, introduction to tropical ornithology. Um, and this uh, book is uh, a book that came out of the COVID lockdowns for me. So um, instead of having fun getting stuck in the mud, I was stuck inside and I couldn't go to Tanzania or East Africa, where I've been doing most of my research for a long time. Um, and it slowly drove me mad not to be able to get out. And I thought, OK, I'm going to go through, make the most of this opportunity and see all the photos that I've got from 20 odd years worth of work in East Africa uh, and see if there are birds in there that I could label and, and tell people little stories about. Um, and uh, I did that, staying at home um, and sending out little tweets. And by the end of the summer, I had 170 odd mini stories about all of these different birds um, and thought, well, maybe there's a book in there. And it turns out that there is. So um, what I wanted to uh, cover today very briefly um, is just the sort of structure of that book and what's in there and why I think it's quite fun. Uh, and the other, the other reason I did it is that um, it sort of tells tales for me uh, that um, I, I think that uh, ornithology and birds are a sort of gateway drug to uh, ecology and conservation in various ways. So um, uh, the story for me started with this little bird uh, down on the left hand side, Rufus tailed weaver. Uh, which was an endemic bird um, found only in, in Tanzania. The only place it was found is northern Tanzania uh, until a few years ago when it was reported in Kenya uh, and colonies started expanding westwards and northwards into Kenya. Um, and I'm interested in the sort of patterns that shape distributions and thought, well, why, why is this bird moving? Why did it have a limit in the first place? Um, and from that fairly um, casual observation of a whole bunch of bird watchers uh, to that question, what, why does the, the, these distributions shift? That led me to looking at a whole bunch of other species, including this uh, gorgeous Pangani longclaw, um, uh, and finding out that about half of all of the savannah bird species in Tanzania are shifting their distribution. And um, what they're doing is up here on the left hand side, they're uh, this left hand side is the places where they're colonizing uh, the big dots uh, and the places on the right are the places they're leaving. So we see this sort of northwestern movement uh, of many of the savannah birds. That's the Serengeti National Park uh, just under my, my mouse there at the moment. Um, uh, and lots of birds moving northwest into Serengeti and up into Kenya, just like the Rufus tail weaver ones. Um, and that made me think, well, OK, I'm a birder. I like birds. How do I understand this? What's driving this pattern? And why are they leaving these areas here to the south um, and uh, outside of some of those protected areas? Um, 
Uh, and that adventure, trying to understand this, led me into a whole set of things from burning World Heritage sites. Uh, that's the Serengeti up in fire earlier this um, this year um, on a fire that, that we were um, uh, uh, setting for various experiments. Um, and trying to understand the ecology of the savannas. And once we sort of thought, well, we now we understand something about how savannas work in protected areas, that then led to well, what's happening outside protected areas um, where there is massive degradation that explains some of these disappearances of species outside protected areas. How do we work with communities in that area to restore them? So the journey for me has been from one of, well, I like birds and I know a little bit about them, through to, oh, let's do some science looking at large scale changes. Then let's try and understand the, the ecology behind those changes right through to practical, uh, let's work with women's groups in pastoralist communities to restore these degraded rangelands. And if there is one sort of hope that I have anywhere is that someone picking up my book might think, oh, that's really interesting. And that they might go through something of this sort of conversion from, from all birds of fun and interesting right through to hardcore ecologist. And that's where I find myself today. Um, I think it's very unlikely, but we'll tell you a few stories anyway, which is such fun. And so the, the way I've, I've described, I've split the book up. Um, essentially, there are three different uh, types of stories in here. Um, you don't need to read any of this book front to, to the cover. You can pick up any one of them. Uh, they stand alone. Um, but there are, there are stories that are about uh, three different types of things. One is what is different about birds in the tropics. Um, one is about interesting things about birds that actually could have been any sort of, uh, you could find birds that illustrate those stories anywhere. Uh, and the third uh, is some of the really weird and wacky birds that come up in East Africa. So in the next um, 10 minutes or so, I'm just gonna give you a taste of a few of the stories from each of those things. We're gonna start with this absolutely gorgeous lilac breasted roller. Um, which is one of the most common uh, and widespread uh, birds in East Africa. Uh, we see them very commonly in the savannas. Um, and it just makes me think every time I see one of these, oh, aren't tropical birds ridiculously colorful? Um, and uh, then the question is, well, are they? Are they more colorful or not? Um, and there are a lot more birds in the tropics, a lot more different types of birds. And there are some really colorful birds in my garden here in York. You know, blue tits are, are pretty gorgeous as well. Um, so the question is, is scientifically, are there are tropical birds more colorful? Um, and there's only last year, did we actually have a fairly definitive answer to that? Uh, and that is that, yes, they are a little bit more colorful. There's slightly more colors on the average uh, bird in the, in the tropics. Um, uh, and they are in slightly more intense in, in hue. But actually the, the biggest bulk of the pattern is that there are just more birds in the tropics and we notice the colorful ones more often. So although there are slightly more colorful birds, um, probably the biggest part is that colorful birds catch your eyes. Uh, and this is actually what the book looks like. So this is the first story uh, it's just a short story about colorful birds. There's a couple of pictures of each one, mostly borrowed from um, uh, some fantastic photographer friends who are really generous in lending their pictures for this book. Um, uh, and each one, each story uh, leads on to the next one in some way, but doesn't need to be read in sequence. So um, uh, here is uh, a beautiful sunbird and the story that uh, comes with that one um, is all about the diversity. So we go from colorful and I say, well, the, there are slightly more colors on your average bird in the tropics, but um, actually there are just many, many more species. And every time I see a beautiful sunbird uh, or any other sunbird, I think, well, how do we squeeze so many more species into the tropics? What's the, what's the explanation for that? If you sit and watch a bunch of flowers uh, like these ones, um, you might see in, in any one short period, a whole bunch of different birds. So the tropics are incredibly rich. Um, uh, and you can see here, so these are the numbers of species of birds in little grid cells across the globe. The desert areas are really rather low, uh, both the, the hot deserts and the colder deserts, but the tropics themselves, uh, the 
key core central areas, maybe three and a half to even six, uh, nearly 600 species in some of these tiny little quarter degree squares uh, in the tropics. And East Africa uh, has one of these great hotspots. Tanzania is, uh, that's Lake Victoria. So from uh, about there, that's Tanzania. Uh, and most of the stories are of birds that live in this area, which is incredibly rich. How do we do that? Why, when you sit and watch a, a, a bush uh, with flowers, do you see not just one sunbird, but maybe five or six species? So the beautiful one I showed you on the, the top left there, but this collared sunbird might come along with a bronze one, or if it's slightly higher up, golden winged sunbirds will be there and scarlet chested sunbirds as well. There'll be a sort of procession of these ridiculous brightly colored iridescent things. Um, how do we cram in so many species? Um, and it's a really hard question that the ecologists have, have puzzled over for a very long time. Our best guess at the moment is that it's a combination of climatic stability over the long term. The tropics have not been uh, wiped clean in the same way that um, northern areas have in particular during the ice ages. Uh, where everything disappeared. The tropics tend to be a little bit more climatically stable, and that allows the accumulation of species over time. Um, plus, there's, there's generally larger areas in the tropics, which we, we often ignore when we're looking at um, maps with different uh, um, perspectives. So somehow, we've got all these different equivalent species, still not entirely certain how they all coexist together, um, but probably, the, well, we, we know that the richest bits of the tropics are also the bits that have been most stable in the long term. So it's an evolutionary process that probably determines that uh, tropical richness. Um, uh, and the other thing uh, that is really different about tropical things, and I'm going to try an experiment here, uh, is that tropical birds make ridiculous noises and sing in duets. And this is a real difference. So this is one of my favorite uh, crazy noises, the red and yellow barbet. We're going to have fly. Okay. Uh, helpfully shouting red and yellow, red and yellow, red and yellow. Red and, yellow. Uh, and that's not just one bird, but that's that's a pair of possibly even oh, yeah. there we go. Uh, an entire family might do that. Other birds do it, slate colored boo boo. So closely um, tied together, you, you can it's hard to imagine this is more than th that's two birds. There's one going and there's a female Can you turn going the volume up slightly. Can you hear those okay? I have something. Uh, there we go. Um, uh, and uh, another another one there, crested Franklin. This is the, the bird that wakes everyone up in the morning. And that, you can hear one bird there occasionally, and then the second one is refined. Yeah. And this pattern of duetting uh, is something that is really different in the tropics that uh, we, we, we puzzled about for a long time. Why do so many birds in the tropics duet? And in particular, why do female birds in the tropics sing. And it turns out that this isn't, um, uh, that we've been asking the wrong question in, in many ways. It's not why do birds, why do female birds sing and duet in the tropics, but why don't uh, female birds sing so much in, in the temperate areas? And in fact, once people started asking that question and particularly female ornithologists, uh, they discovered that actually pretty much all of our female birds do sing. They just don't sing as often uh, elsewhere. Um, so song is a, is a much more universal process in, in birds than, than we originally imagined. Um, but duetting uh, is really important in the tropics, where one bird is saying, essentially, I'm here, I'm here, uh, this is my territory, uh, I'm ready to mate. And the female uh, often is saying, oh, he's taken, he's taken, he's taken. Um, and they will duet together, not in some beautiful pair bonding uh, thing, but as a, yeah, we're both here, we're both here sort of message, which is quite fun and a, and a lovely little story, I think, um, that also illustrates how ornithology is changing and how insights from the tropics are spreading elsewhere. Uh, then some of the stories that uh, that are great for any sort of bird anywhere, but just happen to have an illustration in, in the tropics, 
uh, things like the, the story about the GABA goshawk uh, and how its eyes are able to process information so much faster than ours, which allows it to fly uh, through forests and dense woodlands without crashing. Um, uh, and th essentially they fly blind at about 60 kilometers an hour, um, but just adjust the, their speed to avoid uh, the, the average density of trees, a bit like um, skiers do when they're getting off piste. Um, but their eyes can um, determine temporal resolutions of uh, moving things about two or three times faster than us, uh, which also helps. Um, to the stories about the lappet-faced vultures and vultures' eyesight, uh, how well they can see from uh, up high and how they achieve that, um, uh, to obviously owl hearing. Any of these stories we could have picked temperate birds for, but I put the stories in there um, because we, we need nice pictures of uh, beautiful eagle owls with pink eyelids. Um, and owls hearing uh, is accurate and they can find food uh, to one degree in pitch black because they've got ears slightly uh, misaligned uh, and they they listen to, um, th they measure both the difference at, in time that sound arrives from one ear to the other to determine the horizontal um, uh, angle, the, the direction uh, of a sound, but also the, the difference in volume between the two ears, which gives them much more information about the, um, the, the distance uh, and direction as well. So um, they, they process two pieces of information um, in a way that mammals only do one at a time. Um, we either use volume or we use uh, timing differences, um, but we, we never put the two together. Um, just curious. Uh, and, and one of my favorite stories about ringneck doves, it's a lovely story of convergent evolution. Um, all pigeons have pigeon milk. Um, they feed their babies on a, a milk that is generated not uh, in, in mammary glands, uh, but through modified cells in their crop. Uh, and it's incredibly um, similar uh, in consistency, both proteins and um, uh, fatty content, uh, but also antibodies and all sorts to the mammalian milk. Uh, so a wonderful example of convergent uh, evolution. And um, there could have been, a, there's, there's a very grumpy looking baby ring neck dog uh, sitting in his nest. Um, uh, and then I say some of the, the real African oddities like the hammer cop, uh, what does it do? And uh, hammer cop has this, not only looks really weird and is, is unrelated uh, or quite distantly related to, to all the other birds in its group, um, but it has a fetish for making uh, enormous nests. So this is a, a hammercock nest. It probably took it about 8,000 individual trips, taking that nesting material up to the tree. Uh, and there's this tiny little nest hole. Um, but they don't just make one nest. They make four or five nests in a season. Uh, and it seems to be this obsessive uh, pair bonding experience that they just, they're into home decoration in a big way. Um, and uh, so there's a story about that. Uh, there's a story about hornbills, uh, which are rather attractive uh, looking things, but have a very strange breeding system. Uh, that bird will nest in, there was one nesting in fact, in that uh, tree trunk, in that little slot there. Um, the female goes in there, the male blocks up the hole with mud uh, and seals her in during which time she will drop all of her flight feathers um, and while she's incubating her eggs. And there's a game of, of sort of brinkmanship between the female saying, well, I can't fly. If you don't feed me, I'll die and you won't have any babies this year. Uh, so you've got to come and feed me. Um, uh, and the male who obviously, you know, some males are less good at, uh, at provisioning their, their females and chicks than others. Uh, and this is what ties them in in the whole world. It's a really curious um, piece of, uh, sexual conflict, the way it's worked out. Uh, to the, the wonderful stories, who, who could not have a story about birds in Africa without uh, including ostriches um, and their weird adaptations to life from males like this one, uh, stealing each other's young. Um, uh, uh, you, in fact, we can see here, there are two different sizes. There's a small baby there, that's probably this male's young, uh, and these ones are a bit bigger and he's probably fought another male to steal those ones, not because he really likes them, but because 
it doesn't cost him anything to have other babies around. He doesn't feed them. He just takes them to the right places to feed. But when a jackal or something comes around, there's a better chance that he'll steal someone else's young rather than his own. So he's sort of diluting his own babies there. And well, they're, they're get very big, violent fights over these mega crashes that evolve, that, that gather around the males. Um, so we've got three different types of stories. Um, it's uh, a lot of fun. Uh, I, I like to think it's a lot of fun. There's stories in here for everyone. Um, and there are masses more. I couldn't possibly fit in, in the 15 minutes uh, I've got now any detail in, into these stories. But there's loads of amazing birds, loads of wonderful pictures uh, that have been provided by some of um, uh, my uh, colleagues and friends uh, in Tanzania. Uh, and I'm happy to listen to uh, uh, or take questions about any of these or others. Um, uh, and um, yeah, just want to finish by thanking uh, all those photographers because the book itself uh, would be nothing without uh, those amazing photos to illustrate the, the birds that we're seeing from the Cory Bustard uh, on the left there, uh, probably the largest uh, flying bird in Africa to the uh, yellow collared lovebird on the right hand side. Uh, they've all been, um, there's stories about all of them, 101 of them, as you might imagine from the title. And uh, that is a good point, I think, just to stop and say thank you for listening. Uh, please give me lots of questions. I'm very happy to take anything. That was fascinating. Who knew, who knew uh, ostrich, ostrich, male ostriches stole, stole other ostriches' babies? Yeah. Amazing. They do. <laughs> uh, um, we've had a question come in from Smriti, um, and she said, um, as you've said, Birds are a gateway drug to, towards ecology. So is there a children's book version or inspiration in the works from your 101 Curious Tales? She asks, because there is much talk about science communication and reaching different audiences who may not typically be reached. So hook them young. Uh, I think uh, Smriti is absolutely right, as you know, she, she's absolutely the expert in this area. So. Uh, I'm very happy to um, talk about the potential for turning some of these into um, children's storybooks or, or any of those bits. And um, particularly, um, I'd be particularly keen to find ways to get them into Swahili um, and available to school children in East Africa, uh, where really that's where we need these stories to be found um, and more people talking about them. So, uh, yes, let's. Let's talk about those options. I think it'd be fun. Do you have any follow-up, Smriti? I don't know if we can find you in the list to unmute you. Uh, th thank you. Sorry, I was just looking for... Um, yeah, Colin, that is so in line with something I was just uh, learning about, uh, Project Songbird, that uh, BBC started a year ago, where they were getting or linking up the people from different parts of the world. And there was a lot of intake from, I think it was uh, Southern and Eastern Africa who were interested in telling their local stories, but didn't have access to a lot of the equipment necessarily, which is why then they came up to the BBC in the UK. But then the idea was that they'd go back and film but also share those stories locally because they were saying that of course these local stories matter most to the people who are local but we don't often get the opportunity to create a product or pro like produce this kind of information in beautiful ways but I, I love how you're saying that it would be great to create for local children uh, in Tanzania and and build from there. So I'm, I'm curious about, oh, there must be artists down there who could maybe convert this into, yeah, I don't know. I just, I, I love the idea and I don't know how to start, but I if there's any scope for it, I'd love to help. Thank uh, you. I, I think a sort of Tinga Tinga inspired uh, painting picture book with some of these stories would be amazing. And uh, yeah, there are some fantastic artists doing exciting things in that part of the world. So see how we can make that work. Thank you. Um, and somebody has, also, uh, has asked, do you have a favorite story in the book? Everyone always asks me if there's a favorite, but um, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, 
impossible, I think, uh, to, to give. I, I like the ones that um, more closely match my own research in some ways. So um, one of my favorites is one that I didn't, uh, didn't give here, um, but it's about the um, Teminx Corsa, which is a beautiful fawn colored uh, bird that is a fire specialist. And so when we light these fires in rangelands, it uh, arrives almost from nowhere, seemingly from nowhere. They, they clearly see the smoke at some distance and they'll be flying in and landing on the burnt areas while the fire is still burning elsewhere. Uh, then they, uh, they lay their eggs sort of three or four days after a fire and their eggs are black, uh, like the blackened landscape. So they have to lay on these um, burnt areas. Uh, the chicks that hatch a few weeks later are absolutely gorgeous little fluffy things um, that are uh, also really much blacker than the average wader. Um, and, and they just illustrate for me how fires are an integral part, how many species in this landscape are co-evolved with fire. Um, and fires are set almost always uh, by people, and they always have been. So our ancestors, um, this is where we, we evolved in East Africa, uh, on the plains of East Africa. And there have been hominins in this landscape for millions of years. Um, we know that about 1.2 million years ago, our ancestors first got hold of fire and were able to use it. Um, and at that point, obviously, there weren't modern humans, but there also weren't any of these modern birds or mammals. The entire landscape of East Africa has co-evolved with hominins, our ancestors, lighting fire. Um, so when people then ask me today, uh, is fire natural in this landscape? Well, what's natural in a place where people and our ancestors have been there forever? It's, it's a... a so the, the Temminx Corsa takes me into this really interesting uh, debate and discussion about what is what do we mean by nature uh, in East African landscapes in particular. That's fascinating. Um, Alison Gammons asked that if you could explain a little more how the colours are formed on birds' feathers. Um, is it true that some colours are not pigments but are created by light ref ref reflection? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, let me share this screen again, because it's got all those pretty birds on there. Um, so can you see that? Yes. Yeah. Um, so different pigments are created in different ways. Um, the yellow uh, of the yellow collared lovebird here uh, is a pigment that comes in food. Uh, it's a carotenoid, uh, as is the red in the beak there. Uh, and the browns uh, on the tail, this is a, a spotted morning thrush, uh, and this is a, an, an auger buzzard, that sort of browny orange. Uh, those are pigments that um, are accumulated in food and then deposited in feathers. So if you deprive the, the birds of the, those food sources, then they look really dull and washed out. Uh, and because carotenoids are quite hard to find in a lot of uh, areas, the intensity of those colours is therefore a fairly reliable signal uh, of how good that individual is at finding food. Um, like the flamingos, uh, pink flamingos, in the same way, in, where we have flamingos in zoos, people have to feed them on pink stuff, so they, they, get, they get pink things. Um, uh, and they, they cheat the system, but in the wild, um, the more intense the colour, the better quality the individual probably. Um, so that gives you the yellows and the oranges and reds. The blacks and browns are melanin, um, which uh, is the same sort of brown that we have in our skin. Um, uh, and uh, what um, melanin forms as tiny little crystals. Uh, uh, and if it's just sort of fairly dull and matte, then you get these browns and things. But if you make those crystals um, have bubbles as they form, um, then you end up being able to get iridescence, like on this, this is a superb starling, um, it is truly superb, um, and that is iridescent uh, on the right hand side there. Uh, if this vulturine guinea fowl, the picture went down a bit more, you'd see it also has uh, iridescent purplish 
um, uh, electric purple next. Um, and iridescence is formed by the little crystals of melanin um, having tiny bubbles in. And just like a soap bubble, uh, if you imagine you're blowing a bubble for a child or something, it's got those smeary, beautiful colours on the, the edges of it. That's exactly what happens uh, to generate those iridescent colours on birds. Um, and different lighting angles on different types of iridescence, different size crystals and different size um, bubbles and different shape bubbles will give preferentially different reflectances and different colours. Uh, in that way. It's, it's what we call a structural colour. Um, and we've learned all of this by looking at birds, but what we've done now, and I find absolutely amazing, one of the, the most extraordinary insights of the last uh, decade, uh, in some ways, uh, in, in terms of um, insights from, from looking at birds, uh, is that we, we now go back to incredibly detailed fossils of non-avian dinosaurs and we can see those crystals have fossilized and the bubbles within them so that we know today some some we know the color scheme of some dinosaurs because we can match them to the crystals uh, on existing birds we know that there were dinosaurs with iridescent neck patches we know that there are iridescent blue dinosaurs that there are brown and black ones and there are stripy ones and all sorts uh, which we we've, we've drawn from seeing the crystals in living birds uh, and then finding those fossils uh, in dinosaurs. I find that absolutely extraordinary, um, but really fun. That's blown my mind slightly that you, you can tell the colour of a, a dinosaur. Um, Tabitha Kabor has asked, um, is there any evidence of birds duelling outside of the tropics or is this specific to the tropics? Uh, so duets do occur outside the tropics. Um, there's, there's quite a few species that, that do elsewhere as well, but it's much, much more common. Um, so in, in the UK, for example, uh, tawny owls are a great example. Um, you, you have a male that goes ooh, 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 and a female that goes kivik, kivik, and together they go kivik, ooh, which is the twit to woo that you hear. That's often two birds. It's not always, but it's usually the male and the female duetting uh, quite in a very close synchrony. Um, but it's pretty rare uh, in, in temperate areas. Um, part of that is that actually birds maintaining the same territory throughout the year um, in temperate areas is, is relatively rare, uh, whereas it's much more common in the tropics. Um, so birds stay together uh, as a pair throughout the year and they defend their territory um, outside of the breeding season, whereas in, in temperate areas a lot of birds don't do that. Um, and so they have a different sort of um, different strategy, different needs. So we see more territory defense and pair marking uh, taking place. And um, in, in the temperate areas, the breeding season is also incredibly condensed. Everything has to breed during a relatively short spring period whereas many tropical species uh, are actually capable of breeding uh, quite a lot more periods during the year. Um, so the pair bonding process, or, or not necessarily bonding, but maintaining that um, uh, uh, he's still taken message from females and uh, things is, is really important throughout the year. Whereas in, in the temperate area, breeding season being very short, there are slightly different evolutionary pressures on, on um, what happens at that time of year. It's why the females don't sing as much here, because they're far too busy doing other things. Do you have any follow-up, Tabitha? No, thank you. That well, was really interesting. Yeah. Thank you. And I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot to ask uh, if Alison had any follow-up on the bird feather colour question. Um, but she, she, can, she can ask you now before I go on. Oh, oh, that was great. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Um, and Helen has asked a question. Um, she said that, interestingly, today the Linnaean Society had a talk about language barriers in conversation research. So the idea of translating this into Swahili really resonates with this around seeing these barriers and breaking them down. 
Uh, yeah, um, and so we are uh, talking um, about how that that can work. We have um, someone who has volunteered to translate uh, the book into Swahili. Um, we were, and the publishers are very keen to do this, but we're trying to work out how we can um, make the price effective uh, for a lot of the people who we want to reach. Uh, who will be those the users of that? And it would be good. Um, yeah, if we can find some way to subsidise that slightly. Uh, I think it'll increase the reach of the book uh, as it goes out. There. Okay. Um, did you have any follow on, Helen? Uh, no, no, that's really interesting. Thank you. Uh, it's just curious that the Linnaean Society was specifically talking about a project. Um, you know, to make science more accessible with this, they were calling it a one way mirror of uh, a language barrier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely a, an issue for um, accessibility of science that has been done often in East Africa. Um, and what I didn't touch on here, but the, the book has quite a few examples of uh, ways in which we create additional barriers um, through not only using English, but through the, the specific English names we use sometimes. Um, and um, some of the, uh, so every purchase of this book is going to support the attendance of East African um, ornithologists uh, at the, the next Pan-African Ornithological Congress, which I think is a really um, important part of why to say, you know, buy the book. Uh, some fraction is going to support that uh, through the African Bird Club, who will be choosing those um, students uh, to support in a, in a few years' time, which is really fun. Yes. Um, Caroline Saw asked, um, in your research, does the shoe bill show uh, extinction soon? Um, so shoe bills uh, are an extraordinary bird that I, um, it was one I was very, very pleased. I was out in East Africa this summer and finally saw, uh, and they, if you don't know what they are, um, they're ridiculously large things. Um, they're a sort of almost, um, they're a cross between a stork and a pelican, basically. That's, uh, they're very few close relatives, but they're in that group. Uh, and their beak literally looks like a clog. Uh, they're large grey things like a stalk, but with a beak like a clog. Um, and they're, they're lungfish specialists. So they um, they only nest and live in the biggest papyrus swamps where there are large numbers of lungfish that they swallow whole. Um, the, uh, because they're swamp uh, water specialists, they're, they're not, don't seem to be responding to any climate change signals at the moment. Um, so that's sort of good news. Um, but uh, because they are swamp specialists uh, and swamps are one of the most endangered uh, landscapes in, in East Africa, people like to uh, drain them or use them for uh, other purposes, then they are um, at risk from habitat loss rather than uh, from climate change. Um, and the other major challenge with them is, is that there's a, there's a huge illegal trade uh, in shoe bells. So people like to have them, apparently mostly in the Middle East, uh, marching around on their irrigated um, front lawns uh, where they've got a little pond for them. Uh, and so there's a huge illegal trade in, in shoe bells, um, which is completely unsustainable for a very rare species uh, that breeds incredibly slowly. That's the biggest threat uh, to those. And um, we do have a research program on illegal activities, but we haven't specifically touched on shoe bill trade um, uh, and the pet trade. We've been looking more at um, well, wild meat harvests and um, also ivory trade uh, at York, but it's something I'm, I'm quite interested in. Do you have anything else to ask Caroline? Or did that answer your question? I think that was... That's good, thank you. Thank you. Um, and someone else has asked, um, 
do pandemic species like barn owls change behavior to be to behaviors more similar to endemic species? I'm not sure I entirely understand that question. Can we can we ask for a bit more information from whoever it is? It's an anonymous attendee. Uh, if they can type a little bit more in the question, I'll go on to another one and then we can come back maybe. Thank you. Um, so Smriti has asked uh, about birdsong. Does it change even within the same species in different areas, uh, like a human accident, since uh, it's a learned skill? And is that more prevalent in particular regions of the world? So th there's both things going on. Um, many birds have um, essentially an innate um, capacity to reproduce a simple song. So if you think of cuckoos uh, and the like, they, they obviously never know their parents and they're raised by um, foster parents that will be singing different songs, but they reliably reproduce a, an inherent cuckoo uh, call. And all cuckoos have fairly simple songs, but they're, they're, there are some that are a bit more complicated than, um, than our European cuckoo. Um, and that obviously is 100% um, genetically predetermined. Um, most songbirds um, are come with a sort of inbuilt pattern uh, and then hone and refine it based on what they hear their fathers uh, or mothers singing, depending on, on about what's around. And in those species, you do end up with regional accents. Uh, so um, uh, it, it's best studied in the UK, actually, with um, chaffinches uh, and between Orkney and Yorkshire and Kent and um, they all sound roughly similar but uh, it's similar enough that you would know there were chaffinches but they're very um, obviously different songs uh, and that's that's the consequence of the sort of cultural learned component but if you put a chaffinch um, in a goldfinch nest the the chaffinch cannot replicate goldfinch song and ends up with some sort of um, innate chaffinch-like sound that doesn't sound like the local ones, um, but is sufficient enough that you think, oh yeah, that's probably a chaffinch doing something wrong. Um, so there's both an inherent inbuilt pattern uh, and then this learning tendency um, that, that goes on with songbirds. Um, uh, and again, one of the, the real fa fascinating insights that we've uh, made in the last few years since we've had um, much better understanding of the, uh, the genomes of birds is that um, although the capacity to learn song um, is um, something that birds have evolved independently of, say, our capacity as mammals to learn songs or people, um, it's actually it's a really good example of convergent evolution, again, where the very same genes um, well, the same gene ancestors have evolved the same types of mutations to enable birds to learn uh, vocal song that have also been adjusted in, in human um, uh, genomes uh, as we have evolved the capacity to learn vocal um, mimicry and, uh, and language as well. So um, that, that's opened up a whole new avenue of research into vocal learning in birds and how that might help us to understand um, vocal learning learning in humans. It's quite fun, I think. A follow up. Did you have fo any follow on from that, Smriti? Uh, just a, a quick one. Um, I had read about research in Hong Kong of urban birds like the red whiskered bulbul, where they needed to change their volume or not just volume I think it was also their pitch to be able to be heard by others over the construction noise in Hong Kong because there's just so much of it and that seems like a really quick uh, time scale for learning something and changing something is that 
something all birds do? Is that something that you've seen in the UK? I, I'm just curious about how, how extensive extensive that is. Um, it, it's quite widespread. There's some really good research along roadsides, um, listening to bird song along roadsides, um, and it's different to songs. They, they do have different volume, but also, as you say, different pitch to avoid interference with traffic noises. Um, they pitch their songs at, at different levels. Um, it seems to be quite a widespread phenomenon. Um, we, we don't know whether it's evolved or um, whether it is um, learnt, uh, given that flexibility that, that birds have to adjust their song to what they're hearing, it's possible that if they're, if they're nesting close to a, a road, then they don't hear those lower frequencies that into, or I don't know if you remember which way around it, lower or higher, the frequencies that are interfered with by the road, then they won't learn them. They'll only learn the other part of the song. Uh, and so that's, uh, it could happen very quickly indeed. Um, and that's what we see at the moment. Thank you. Um, it's not a question, but Alison Gammons uh, mentioned that Book Aid International are involved in distributing books to children in Africa. So she was just passing that information along. That's very handy. I'll make a note of that. Thank you. Right. Uh, the question that came in earlier, um, I think, is has there been any observations of local adaptation by species that have a wide global range that shows convergent behaviours by species at different latitudes, e.g. local accents, singing habits, nesting behaviour, or are pandemic species as generalist behaviour similar wherever they are, if that makes more sense. Okay, I think I, I, think I get the idea now. Um, uh, and, and I think the answer, uh, or part of the, the sort of complexity of the answer to that is what do we mean by species anyway? Um, and although, you know, we, we look at the pictures of all these birds and think they're incredibly different. Um, we know what a species is, obviously we know what a species is. It turns out that we're, we're really bad at that uh, in some ways. And there's quite a lot of diversity that occurs um, below the level of what we, we immediately see as humans. The birds clearly know the differences, but we don't. Um, so, for example, um, one of the, the other insights that we've had in the last few years from new genetic data is that um, white eyes, which are a, a group of small songbirds um, that are quite closely related to the, the sunbirds, they're all yellowy, greeny things uh, with a big white ring around their eye. Uh, in general, uh, and they're very widespread across the tropics, um, uh, and they're well known for speciating. So um, each tropical island has its own species of white eye, um, but across the mainland of Africa, uh, the main bit of the continent, there has been just one or two super widespread species recognised until very recently that were um, the African yellow white eye. Um, and what we've discovered now is that this bird that is pretty much the same from Gambia to East Africa to um, some bits of Southern Africa as well, um, wherever there are mountain ranges, uh, particularly in East Africa, a population of these birds has independently gone up to the top of those mountains and then colonized the montane forests. And during that process has evolved darker, greener plumage with a broader eye, white eye and usually a little bit bigger. Um, and it's they've done this repeatedly. So we, we used to think that there was a sort of lowland species, the yellow white eye, and an upland species, the montane white eye. We now know that those montane white eyes are much more different from each other than they are from the nearby lowland uh, population of yellow white eyes. Um, and so each time a population has gone up, it has independently uh, evolved this same moss green colour and a broader white eye and a little bit bigger, um, to the point where we thought they were all the same species uh, across these mountains and that they'd sort of hopped from mountain to mountain somehow. Um, but in, in some ways, I, th I think that that's, that's the, the issue here. And the consequence is that... Um, 
taxonomists are very upset about calling, I think we have to call all of these things one species these days, uh, say the yellow ones and the green ones uh, are all just one species, or they have to split the yellow one into many different species because of the, the sort of rules that taxonomists use when they're naming things. They have to name um, a unique clade, uh, and if a clay, it can't contain another species. Uh, so the species must split dichotomy into two, two bits. Um, and so the consequence is now we're, we're sort of flooded with these new species that have been identified of yellow things, yellow white eyes, uh, in lots of different places. Um, but uh, because we, we've spotted this, this thing going on. So if I think of something ubiquitous, like a, a barn owl, um, every time it goes up a mountain, and comes up to some other things, it probably does a little bit of local adaptation. At the moment, none of those things have become a different species, uh, but they might be, and they often are, a little bit darker looking and a little bit spottier looking. But if one of those populations should become so different that we call it a different species, we then almost certainly split the, the widespread barn owl into a whole bunch of species as well. And that becomes really, um, complex. So uh, that's, that's why I say it depends on how you define a species, but certainly there is local adaptation among widespread species. How far it goes determines whether we say that species is particularly widespread or whether it actually we split it into lots of different groups. Um, so it's a, possibly a more complex answer than people would expect it. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, wait. Oh. I think we have another question in. Oh, it was just uh, MKJ saying thank you very much. It was really interesting and, and insightful, um, the answer. So that's good. I had one quiz, quick question that I, just from the very first slide, I think, of your presentation where you showed the movement of birds from the south to the north. Mm. Is that, has that led to, has that, affected numbers or is it just sort of a, an on mass movement and they haven't been detrimentally affected or not? Uh, so uh, that's a really good question um, and the answer is we don't know. Um, so although we, we just about have enough information to map changes in distribution of uh, the lowland species, uh, we don't have any information uh, about populations of birds in Tanzania at all. Um, not that we can use to, to produce the sort of information we have in the UK. So we don't know. Um, I think there's, there's two things going on, is, is what we understand. So we see the climate related shifts. And in these birds that we're looking at, they're mostly expansions of range um, because the birds that, that I've been looking at are ones that like it like places with long dry seasons. Um, they like the savannas. Uh, and that's what's been increasing. The, the length of the dry season has increased fairly reliably across quite a lot of East Africa. Um, it's also become, uh, the, the wet season has become more erratic and more intense, but there've been longer droughts um, and the dry season is definitely expanding. Um, if we were looking at other species that prefer the moister areas, I think we would have a very different picture, um, but we just don't even have enough information about the distributions of those species to understand the changes in, in detail there, uh, which is one of the, the challenges we have in East Africa, is that, that we need more people um, who, who are excited about these birds in the first place uh, to, to keep track of what's going on, um, looking at distributions and abundance changes. Well, on that note, I'll give a final call out if anyone has any final questions. Um, I think that's it from everybody. I, I'd like to say thank you very much. It was it was fascinating. I've learned an awful lot in that in that one hour. So thank you very much for that. Um, very welcome. It's been fun. And, uh, good. And and just to say that we have uh, some more Ask the Authors coming up in the new year, um, so keep your eye out. Um, they'll be on completely different subjects, but it uh, might still be of interest. So thank you, Colin. Thank you all. <laughs>